Just a nightmare. Just a nightmare. Indians audi auditing his income tax and all that fading now. Only a trauma house, a drama, yes, pattern. Justin sat up and turned on the light. His first thought was that he was only dreaming that he had awakened. For at the foot of his bed, there stood a little green man in a miniature NASA spacesuit. I am Apollon of Mars, he said. Come with me at once. I, too. When he became not I, but I, too, Dodson found he had an ally, a holy guardian angel, a secret self, as it were. This person, like Ped Ng or Anon of Ibid, lived in the inter interesterix of the code, rather than being a, single, a signal as such. And he called himself Lewis, like Seth and J.H.V.H. He became, began dictating books, and Dodson, as dutifully as Jane Roberts or Moses, began tra transcribing them. He published them under the name Lewis Carroll, because Lewis sang a lot while dictating, and Dodson was addicted to puns. Dodson, Dodson wondered a great deal at the revelations Lewis dictated to him, dimly grasping the implications that would not be understood fully until another hundred years of mathematics involved. Sometimes Lewis would take over for a few minutes while Dodson was working on his own masterpiece on mathemati mathematical logic, and a proof would appear that some doeggers are thistles. <laughs> it was a good working relationship, and between them, Lewis and Dodgson undermined the entire edifice of Victorian morality and Victorian science. Still, Dodgson could only photograph the naked little girls. He couldn't bring himself to touch them. There is no governor anywhere. Hugh Crane served his contempt of Congress sentence at Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary, the, quote, gentleman's club, as the moth calls it, where the government incarcerates those ritzy felons who are not likely to shiv a guard or climb a wall. He worked in the library with Alger Hiss. They both watched the famous checker speech on the TV in the rec room. This was a masterpiece of primate oratory in which a vice presidential candidate named Richard Nixon argued that huge sums of money given to him by various businessmen were not intended as bribes and were not expected to result in reciprocal favors on his part. As an old carny man, Mr. Hess asked Mr. Crane, what do you think of that performance? That dog shit was very good, Crane said professionally, but he left out mother. Another distinguished guest at Lewisburg that year was an aging Idaho poet and folk singer, Ezra Pound, who was also in for un-American activities. He and Crane never got along well because Pound, who had seldom been outside Idaho, distrusted all, distrusted all Easterners. Crane performed yoga exercises every day in his cell. The Illuminati, of course, subsequently scanned the notes he kept on those neurophysiological experiments. The most interesting items were the following. April 23, 1952. It helps if you identify each letter of Om with one of the three gods of the Hindu trinity. A is Brahm, the creator, let it explode upward from the diaphragm, like the big bang of creation itself. U is Vishnu, the preserver. Hold it so long that it vibrates like the rhythm of life, the big beat of Beethoven's seventh. M is Shiva, the destroyer. Close the lips in a decisive bite of this is the way the world ends as you enter the silence. May 1st, 1952. Today, unexpectedly, per Diana, it was so much simpler than I ever guessed, and it is obviously a matter of practice. No wonder the yogis say that it's dangerous to do this without a guru. I am no better or worse morally and no wiser or more spiritual. Repetition is the whole key. Force the nerves and muscles and glands. Force them day after day and it happens. The chief function of the guru is to ensure that you don't take advantage of the new freedom too quickly and get yourself in trouble with the authorities. The guru, guru doesn't help it happen at all, as the honest ones admit. You do all the work yourself. The guru just makes sure that the rapture flows into, quote, safe, 
domesticated channels. Without such a moral watchdog, I am free to do as I bloody please. I just realized why all the real occult schools are so damn secretive, why the ordinary seeker is given a lot of double talk and ejected out the same door wherein he came. If everybody could do this, the whole world would be in continuous revolution. There's an asterisk. Terran Archives, 2803. Diana was the Sanskrit name used by the Hindic primates to describe the opening and printing of the neurosomatic circuit. The term and the te techniques of inducing it became Chan in China and Zen in Japan. It was always supervised by an alpha male for the reasons Crane suspected. It represents uh, the dawning of post-primate consciousness and the H-E-A-D revolution, thereby rendering the biot independent of the primate dominant submission hierarchy. May 27, 1952. Another successful Diana. There's nothing to it, really. The brain obviously operates on the same principle as those fellows in The Haunting of the Snark. What I tell you three times is true. Three million times is more accurate. It was marvelous, better than the first time, and I'll never identi identify with Cagliostro the Great, or Hugh Crane, or even me, or the perpendicular pronoun ever again. I can see more and more clearly why all this is sealed with seven seals and hidden behind all kinds of mystification. Society as we know it is based on torture and death or, or the threat of torture and death. I am in, in here to be tortured, although the authorities will never admit that. What they do with heretics in other countries is torture. What we do here is penalology. The cage experience is profoundly punishing to the average human as to any primate. It is the form of torture our society countenances. It is no torture to me only because I have learned certain neurological arts every stage magician learns. But if everybody could go into Diana at will, nobody could be controlled by fear of prison, by fear of whips or electroshock, by fear of death even. All existing society is based on keeping those fears alive to control the masses. Ten people who know what I know would be more dangerous than a million armed anarchists. July 23, 1952. I can hardly write. Today I reach Samadhi. It makes Diana look like nothing by comparison. All my certainty is gone. I should be terrified, but instead I'm ecstatic. If this is possible, Anything is possible. Asterix. Terran Archives, 2803. Samadhi was the Hindu Duistani name for the opening and printing of the sixth metaprogramming circuit in the frontal lobes of the post-primate brain. Most of those who achieved it before the head revolution were just as bewildered as Crane and could say only that the experience was, quote, ineffable. These notes were not published when Hugh came out of prison. Instead, he brought forth a book cheerfully titled, There is No Governor Anywhere, which explains some, not all, of his magic escapes, and set this in the context of a philosophy which declared every individual a creator of his own universe. The polemics against government and organized religion were tactless, to say the least, for a performer depended upon depending upon public goodwill. Crane did not hesitate to identify his outlook blunt, bluntly as atheism and anarchism. To everyone's surprise, including Crane's, the book became a bestseller and he became the most controversial man in the United States. Even the fearful 50s, even with even in the fearful 50s, even with American Legion and John Birch chapters constantly reminding everyone of his drug arrests, his sex arrests, and the documented fact that prison authorities had delayed his parole because of his homosexual seduction of a younger inmate. Hugh Crane acquired a new following. TV gingerly tested him on the egghead ghetto of Sunday afternoon, then promoted him to the late, late talk shows.
He managed to end every appearance with the words, There is no governor anywhere. You are all absolutely free. And around then, to the vocal dismay of press and clergy, a club owner decided he was a freak act. That's in quotes. They'll hate him, but they'll come. And Crane was able to work as a magician again. The crowd overflowed into the street, and many were turned away. Cagliostro introduced a new escape from a lead box that had been welded closed in view of the audience. There is no restraint that cannot be escaped, he told them in an intense tone. We are all absolutely free. A pudgy Broadway columnist named Benny Benedict, who was just starting to get a following, interviewed him the next day. How the hell did you manage that welded box escape? Benedict asked bluntly. I used real magics, the great Cagliostro pronounced. Come off it, Benedict said. But Cagliostro merely grinned at him impudently. To open the next door. Longevity is an optimist's heaven and a pessimist's hell. Anonymous Graffito, Larry Blake's Pub, Berkeley, California. Sarah, 1980. Terran Archives, 2803. Robert Anton Wilson belonged to a number of, quote, secret societies, unquote, and was the founder and leader of at least one such group. As an initiate of particular, particularly every organization of occultists of his day, which was not particular, which was not patently lunatic, he was bound by all sorts of solemn vows and oaths of secrecy. His works and his autobiography make it sufficiently evident that he took these vows very seriously indeed. He wrote a set of books, sometimes alone and sometimes with Shea or Leary, treating systematically the major problems of what might be called the scholarship of the occult tradition, the Illuminati legendary, the Holy Grail, the Troubadour, the Knight, Knights Templar cults in medieval Europe, Freemasonry, the Tarot Cards, the I Ching, alchemy, astrology, ritual, magic, witchcraft, etc. With the sole exception of sex and drugs, where for once Wilson's language is very thinly veiled, perhaps because what he was writing about was sufficiently well known to the counterculture of that violently, counterculture in quotations, of that violently barbaric age, all these books purport to deny what Wilson is in actual, actual fact, not so much proving as quietly exposing for those who have eyes to see. Until you catch on, this device can be, to put it mildly, misleading, and it never ceases to be exasperating. Illuminatus, for example, claims to deny and parody the existence of the secret chiefs of Western occultism. It does nothing of the sort. If that had been Wilson's real end in view, he would never have written the book. It would have been in his crude language, putting tits on the Pope. However, it is certainly misleading. It, it misled Nam Nomis of Noom. For years, Nomis ignored Wilson. In volume 12 of the collected works published by Algor Algol Press, where many of Nomis's works on scientific shamanism are gathered up, Wilson's name is not mentioned. In the later volume 17, the only place Nomis mentions Wilson, in the essay, Last Voices of the Unistat Empire, Decadence and Decline. Nomis, Nomis attacks him precisely on a point, the five Dillingers, where Wilson is covering his tracks. Why no other mention of Wilson by Nomis? Is the whole history of scientific shamanism? In the whole history of scientific shamanism, Wilson is the one author who really indisputably gives away the show, divulges the secret. One would think that Wilson would be Nomis's favorite author, outranking, outranking even Carl Jung and Robert Graves. To believe that Nomis's silence is deliberate and designed in, in his turn, and designed in his turn to cover his tracks, is to tempt oneself with the little paranoias of the crackpots, crackpots who beset this subject as it is. Still, it is surely very mystifying. The or 